<clears throat> we are certainly glad to be in church tonight and beautiful exhortation from brother John um, the enthusiasm he developed at the end was a result of his faith and confidence in the in this church and the message he believes in I know we are 7.30, and normally on a Saturday night, I'd like to send you home early, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit here before we go home, <clears throat> and um, I thought we had a great service on Wednesday night. Uh, over tonight, I'd like to not just beat around too much, but to get to the point. I'm looking at the Epistle of James. And uh, this beautiful song, Chosen in God for Redemption's Plan. And you think about each one of us here tonight. There's a process that God must take us through. And uh, the process that God is taking us through would either prepare us for the first resurrection that comes in two phases, first and second phase, or it will prepare us for the final resurrection, which over the years has been really seen as a bad resurrection. But it's not really that bad. The final resurrection is a resurrection where the general harvest would be reaped. Uh, there are people that will come up and will die again under the judgment of God, but the masses will come up in the final resurrection and be saved. The first resurrection is not an easy resurrection to be a part of. Uh, we like to sing that song, Oh, I want to be in the first. Uh, that's a good desire. But the first phase of the first resurrection uh, resurrects individuals that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's not easy to do. Uh, the second phase are they that stand without fault before the throne of God. That's not easy to accomplish either. Uh, but if we fail to make it in the first or second phase of the first resurrection, then the final resurrection will have that element that will rise up and be saved. Uh, Jesus told the Pharisees uh, in, his, um, in his address, I think it was in Matthew, the 12th chapter, he says, the Queen of the South shall rise with this generation and condemn it. For she repented, uh, she, uh, what did it say? Let me get that scripture. It's, um, I'm back in James here, but I just want to back up here into Matthew, the 12th or 13th chapter, 12th chapter of Matthew. And Jesus, the, the people here wanted to see a sign. And uh, they asked, it said, we want to see a sign. And uh, Jesus um, told them, uh, here in verse 38, um, there, there are so many beautiful things in this chapter 12 of Matthew. He talks about demon possession and casting out. Do you know, here in Matthew chapter 12, and when the Pharisees, they heard uh, that Jesus, they heard uh, Jesus cast out demons, right? It wasn't that verse 22? Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. See, sometimes blindness and dumbness is demonically inspired. And this boy, apparently the child or whoever it was, was born blind and dumb. And you cast the demon out and that person could be free. I'm not talking about old age catching up on you, where the body is worn out. I'm talking about a young man born dumb and deaf. Uh, a mute, uh, they would call him in today's society. And Jesus, they brought this young man, dumb and blind and dumb. Um, and um, where is it? And he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Uh, people are always astonished. You remember that statement I made, the greatest enemies 
uh, to missions are prejudice and indifference, with ignorance being the mother of both. And uh, you'll be surprised to know how many people would not accept what you say because they become familiar with you. Uh, you can be a child of God, sent from God, but if the people know you, uh, they will become familiar with you and not receive your word as the word of God. And this was commendable uh, with some of the churches that Paul preached. Paul says, you received not our word, uh, the Thessalon Thessalonians, right? Thess Thessalonica, he, uh, Thessalonians, he spoke to, and he made that statement: "I got your finger in James, and I've got your hand in Matthew, and here I am running to Thessalonians right now. I think it's the uh, First Thessalonians. Uh, might want here First Thessalonians. Uh, Paul says he says." Uh, <clears throat> For this cause we thank God, chapter 2, and verse, um, as a matter of fact, chapter 1 and verse 6 says, and you became, he told the people at the saints at Thessalonica, he said, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. See, when God raises up a ministry, people are to follow the ministry and the Lord. See, the Lord is not here literally, but he's got... Uh, sometimes an appointed ministry uh, that people need to follow. And uh, Paul said here to the Thessalonians, he says, verse uh, 6 in First Thessalonians chapter 1, he says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. It was not a church with a lot of joy, joy, joy. Uh, but they received the word in much affliction with joy. Isn't that what it says? With joy of the Holy Ghost. See, the, the joy of God doesn't come uh, when you receive a check in the mail. Uh, the word of God, the, the joy that the Holy Ghost gives, doesn't come because everybody's treating you nice. The joy of the Holy Ghost might come when you're afflicted and you're persecuted. You, there's a joy that comes up. I'm pleased to suffer with him. And this is something uh, we need to talk about maybe later uh, tonight. I'm not sure. But Paul goes on here in chapter 2. And um, uh, he says here uh, in verse, uh, just to make it short, he says, he tells the saints that they walk worthily. He says, you witness, verse 10, second chapter, verse 10. You witness that God also... Uh, and God also is a witness, he says, how holily and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. And uh, it's important that ministers conduct themselves as ministers. It is important that every one of us that are part of the ministry, we carry ourselves with dignity and with a certain a uh, certain respect for the ministry and the office that we hold. Uh, we can't just run loose, put loose and fancy free and hope to represent God. But Paul says, he says, when we were there and uh, it might have been Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus that accompanied Paul, he is writing uh, here to this church. He said, how, how, how holily. Uh, I like that. He says, you witness and God also is witness how holily, how we behaved ourselves holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and commanded and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. That's what a pastor does. He gets up there and uh, hopes that the word of God that he promotes would reach on in and penetrate the hearts of the children of God in that assembly and change them, uh, exhort them. And he goes on further on, uh, verse 13, he says, um, oh, verse, verse 12, he says that you walk worthy of God. Everybody say worthy of God. Worthy. See, I'm here preaching to you and talking to you tonight and my desire is that you and I, we walk worthy 
of God. We have a God that we are following. And we need to conduct ourselves and behave ourselves worthy of God. And I don't need you to tell me how to dress, but when I walk out in society and I'm in front of the individuals, I have to be careful how I conduct myself. myself. Uh, when I have, I'm in the presence of the saints, I must be careful how I conduct myself. This is important. Uh, public testimony is important. I felt the Lord give us a lesson uh, during the meeting about this. Uh, we said we speculated. Isn't that what we said? We speculated, but it was a good speculation that the tail of the dragon drew a third part of the stars of heaven to the ground. And uh, we like to think that as the devil stands face to face with a woman, in order for her to destroy the woman, he must destroy the ministry. And if he can get jokers in the pulpit, the whole church will become a joke. If he get playboys in the pulpit, the whole church will become just another social activity. And ministers have to be careful, especially those that are called of God. But don't you worry about that because there's not a lot called of God. Uh, it says, Job, when he writes, he says, one among a thousand, a messenger from God. You look at the Bible. Uh, here was uh, all Israel, millions of people, one prophet at a time. Uh, scarcely you would have two prophets alongside each other. Sometimes you might have two, sometimes three. But among millions of people, lots of priests, lots of talkers, but few men that hear from God that rise up and share a message that is designed to correct God's people from their error and turn them to God. And so uh, here <clears throat> Paul is making this statement. He says that you walk worthy of God who had called you into his kingdom and glory. Verse 13 together. He says for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Paul says, for this cause also, we're thanking God without stopping. You see, when I see a child of God improve and they're, they're becoming spiritual and in their mouth is the word of God, uh, all they can think about. When I hear a man like Brother John gets up three o'clock in the morning, I like him. I like that. Get up three o'clock in the morning and what you want to do? Uh, make pancakes and eggs. No, uh, that might be a part of what you do when you get up because I do that sometimes uh, rarely I haven't done that for almost a almost six months to a year now I need to do that sometime but I get up and very quietly I sit down and I study the word of God uh, that's a good time uh, you have the peace and quiet uh, stillness of the night uh, to hear from God you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And when I hear Brother John get up and he search the scriptures and he's reading uh, these uh, areas that we covered. And that's what Paul Timoth uh, told Timothy. He says, he says, the things that thou hast heard of me. Now, Brother John is in this, in this fellowship longer than I was. Uh, he uh, accepted this message earlier than I did. I came in later on. Uh, but to hear him sit down and study the lessons I put, uh, God has to be working in his life. Amen. Amen. Paul told Timothy, he says, let no man despise your youth. Uh, Timothy was a young man. People had a problem following him. And so uh, when you hear this uh, in verse uh, 13, he says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Everybody, because... When you receive the word of... Now, where was that? What Paul is talking about? Uh, he's talking, it was in Thessalonica, that they received the word of God. How did they get it? Paul had a book. Uh, he had a big scroll. What did Paul do? Paul got up and he spoke. See, when we understand, hindsight is always twenty twenty vision. But when we understand that a man like Peter and Paul existed in the same time frame. Paul came after Peter. P 
Peter could say, well, I know Jesus before you did, Paul. But he didn't. Peter got into trouble with Paul. And Paul was very egotistic when he got in. See, the process had to be worked in Paul. But there was some ego in Paul that he says, he says, when we had that problem, he says, when I went up to Jerusalem to resolve the circumcision problem, he says, they that were before me, whatever they were, doesn't matter. That's not a good statement for a man to say. I mean, he's calling Peter, James, and John. He says, I went up for them to, uh, to bring this matter of the circumcision before them. He says, they were before me in the Lord. Whatever they were, doesn't matter. Think that's a nice statement? He, but, but that was Paul. Paul had to be Paul. If Brother Goodwin was not Brother Goodwin, I would not have remained in this fellowship. He was a tough person to deal with. But I'm glad he was what he was in order to jar my spirit and bring me in submission. Paul had to be what Paul was in order to help the rest. Now, when uh, Peter came up and Paul made mention of that, he says, when uh, we were with the Gentiles and Peter came and he sat down and hobnobbed with us and he ate what the Gentiles were eating, you know, you know. But then they saw some people coming. And there were some Jews from Jerusalem coming to join them. Peter changed his attitude. God, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. I'm going to be in trouble. He changed his attitude. And he started to <clears throat> be back a Jew again. Hobnob less with the Gentiles. You think he got off? Paul rebuked him to his face. We don't have all the details, but Paul would say, brother, you're fickle. You're vacillating. One moment you're with the Gentiles, and you look at these brothers coming from Des Moines, I mean, from Jerusalem, and you become fickle. Did I say Des Moines? Oh, I meant Jerusalem. And you become fickle. Well... You got, you got to do it the way we have been told to do it. Not really. If it is the commandment of men, I don't have to follow it. If it is the commandments of God, I must follow it. Traditions are good and traditions are bad. Principles are good and principles are bad. Now listen to me carefully. When you become imprisoned by your tradition it's bad when you become imprisoned by your principles it's bad that which is meant to give you freedom in God becomes a wall to head you in so you're building an ark when the walls of the ark becomes a prison wall we're in trouble the walls are designed to keep the world out, to keep the flood out. But when we build that and it makes us all prisoners, we're in trouble. Did you hear what I just said? If I were you, I'd write that down because that's important. And so when Peter vacillated, Paul rebuked him. But isn't it wonderful to read Peter's writing? And I'm moving on a little further on here. I got your finger tangled up all over the place. But in 2 Peter, in 2 Peter, the writing of Peter, 2 Peter, uh, right down to chapter 3, uh, Peter writes concerning Paul. Paul that rebuked him. Paul that corrected him. Peter was before Paul in the, in the work of God. But here is what Peter said in his writing he says <clears throat> an account verse 15 chapter 3 second Peter he says an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul he called him beloved <clears throat> brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you he says, 
as also in all his letters. What was Peter reading? He was reading Paul's letters. See, I wrote some articles. I wrote, send up, somebody says, what happened to the Midnight Cry magazine? Well, we sent it out, and I never hear enough feedback coming back from the magazine. So no point in spending eight, nine hundred dollars an issue, and we're not getting results. If you're fishing in one spot, and no fish is coming, grab your hook, go home, or find a different spot. And when you send articles out, and you put things out <clears throat> for saints to read, and they don't even know what is said, because they're too busy watching shows on television, then you're wasting your time. Don't give that which is holy to dogs. Don't cast your pearl to the ones that don't appreciate it. Jesus told his disciples, he said, when you go into a city, if that city reject you, brush the dust. Don't park up and hope to stay. Brush the dust and leave that city. That's how they operated back there. Now we stay in the city to get pension. <laughs> Retirement. Savings. I got to get my, you know, settle down. That's why the gospel is not being spread around the world. Because we park up. But the Lord is going to change all of that as we head towards the end of this age. And Peter said, he says, account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him had written unto you. Also in all his epistles, all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some hard <clears throat> to understand. Well, I've been serving the Lord. No, no, no. The Lord was using Paul in a different way. Paul had a message that Jesus didn't preach. Peter was exposed to Jesus' message. But Jesus had told them that I've got things to tell you that you're not ready to hear. Well, Paul was telling them things that Jesus wanted him to tell them. That the disciples did not hear. And so some of these things were deep. When you read them, what does he mean? <clears throat> Now here's the beautiful part of all of that. He says, hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned. Somebody pick it up and says, well, praise the Lord, I'm going to preach it anyways. See, the most dangerous man is a man with the Bible in his hand that God has not called. It's not that mugger down the street. It's not that, not that terrorist. You can recognize the mugger. You can recognize the terrorist. But when a man got the Bible. And he put it like this. He holds it like this. I hope I can remember all the pages I got marked up here. Hold it like this. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, brother. It's good to see you. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you, brother Sam. But then I'm going to change my voice a little further. Well, brother, it's good to see you. See that anointing in my voice? Brother John, oh, God bless you, brother, for being faithful all these years. But, Ben, you're so humble. you got to become an apostle or something, you know? I, I, I butter people up. The most dangerous man is an uncalled man with a Bible in his hand. He'll make, he'll destroy more souls than a terrorist released on society. But here's Peter. And I love this relationship because these men lived along the same timeline. Peter says, which they that are unlearned and unstable twist from the true interpretation rest as they do what come on come on they what 
What was Peter calling Paul's letters? Scripture. Scripture. It's hard for a man living in your time to read your writing and call it scripture. You know how you can be able to do that? You need God to touch your mind. You need prejudice to be taken away from your mind. And God must touch you for you to see that. God touched Peter. And he says, Paul's letters. He says, hold that letter. Keep that letter. Keep, keep that letter to the Ephesians. Timothy, hold on to this. You brothers, hold on. It's scripture. Paul's letter. This, this letter. Was he right? Yes. It is in the book. Yes. At that time, it was just letters floating around. But it was in the book. Peter was right. And <clears throat> so back here, where were we? Uh, we're back in James. Let's leave the rest and come back to James. And so James is writing here. And <clears throat> James, uh, the brother of Jesus. Isn't that right? Uh, the other James was dead. Uh, he was killed with a sword. So James is writing here. He says, James is a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. And then he makes some statements here. And I like this. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers trials. See, temptations, <clears throat> if you have an Oxford Bible, in the margin it will say trials. Uh, when you fall into a trial, a trial, a trial, the boss fires you. Well, the boss to be blamed. No, no, no. If you're elect, you're the one on trial. Well, I hit the car and I dented it and it's going to cost me some money. Listen, the man who hit you <clears throat> might be at fault or you might be at fault out there. But if you're a child of God and elect, you're on trial. How do you respond when that man shows you a wicked sign on the road? How do you respond to somebody that is obnoxious? That's right. It is so good when somebody meets you and says, Are you living in that house in Hague? Today, I met somebody. She says, an elderly lady, she says, Are you living at that house in Hague that has the best looking flowers outside? I said, Yes, they're not any there anymore. Met her today. Or she says, This is my husband. She introduced me to the senior old man sitting there. She says, we stopped by to admire your garden. I said, but you know, today I'm a garden, gardener, <clears throat> but tomorrow I'm a pastor. Can I let that slip? No. She need to know that the reason why I got a nice garden is because I'm a Christian. James is writing here, he says, when you fall into trials... Lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord, for another bad day. We are so acclimatized to thank God only for the good times. That that which was designed by God to help us, we don't want to thank God for. The good days are not going to change your spirit. It's the bad days, the trials that will change you. Listen to this. I'm going to skip some of these things and come down here. <clears throat> it says here, he says, let the brother, verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice. He struggled for years and suddenly you got a job, a good paying job. Do what? Rejoice. The brother of low degree got promoted. So rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. rejoice. <clears throat> Don't let the devil lull you to sleep tonight. <clears throat> so, and that's all right. He says, but the rich. What is the rich to do? In that he is made low. What is he supposed to do? Come and read the context of that. What is he supposed to do? Rejoice. Rejoice. He just lost all his money. Rejoice, man. You're elect. God is working on you. 
the low man has a reason to rejoice, <coughs> but the rich man, having lost everything, also has a reason to rejoice. Because the low man can be destroyed by getting the promotion, the rich man might be saved by losing it all. I hope you have ears to hear what I'm saying. And then he goes on here, <coughs> he said, verse 12, together, blessed is the man that survives the trials, to survive the temptations. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to give them that love him. When a man is tried, he is being purged. That sickness on your body, if you're elect, is meant to save you. When you go through that trial and it's over, have you, drawn, have you been drawn closer to God? If not, it's coming back, my friend. If you're elect and you didn't learn your lesson from the bad experience, guess what? <clears throat> it's coming back. You're getting a double dose. Listen to me with your hearts tonight. It says that the man say when he's tempted, <clears throat> oh, I blame the devil, you know, the devil really, he's really after me. You should thank God the devil is after you because he is designed to make you stronger in God by tempting you. Hmm. Which one of us would say, thank God the devil really tempted me today? Well, you wouldn't say that if you yield to the temptation. <clears throat> but if you s s reject it and resist it and flat from the temptation, he can say, well, <clears throat> the Lord gave me a good trial today. Whatever happened today, Lord, thank you. I did not crumble. I did not fall. <clears throat> I was victorious. You don't see the devil, we like to call the devil the enemy. When you're elect, you need that enemy. You know, when you're studying to pass an exam, you study hard and the exam papers come. And here's the test. I resist you, I resist you, I resist... No, no, no. Write the test. Show what you can do. Because the devil was designed by God to try you. He cannot defeat the elect. So don't blame the devil, don't blame God. It's you and trial, my friend. You are on trial. Let's read it. Let's see what James says. He says, <clears throat> let, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away. Verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Right? But every man is tempted. See, the devil cannot tempt you except you got flesh for him to work with. He can't force you. He says, he says, uh, <clears throat> but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin. When it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and perfect and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, nor shadow and turning. God wants to save you. But you need the test. You need the trials. When you hear a preacher says, When you when you accept Jesus, all your trials are gone, that's a hypocrite. Never call of God. Your trials are necessary. Rejoice when you're tried. But make sure that the goal is being purged. 
Count it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try its support of our Christian life. Amen. 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 And he goes on here, he says, <clears throat> he says, um, verse 19, because of time I'm skipping here. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man, that and woman, be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to get angry. Well, what are we talking about? Everybody say self-control. See, James is heading up to a beautiful lesson. And he says, now, <clears throat> it's your lust. Everybody say, my lust. My, lust. my anger. My, my impatience. My so all of that belongs to us. So the devil will come now. He says, oh, he's still impatient. Let me try him. You see, somebody told me, because of my attitude, just this week, there's a presumptuous brother, does things, gets into trouble, and the whole world wants to kill him except me. And somebody says, why are you doing this for him? Listen, you do wrong, God will judge you. You make a public, yourself a public nuisance, you need to be disciplined. Them that sin before all, rebuke before all. Well, he did that already. How many times must I forgive him? But you see, when it boils down, I told the person that told me this, that you're having too much. Why are you helping him? I said, no, I'm not helping him. I said, when I show the goodness of God to someone, I'm helping me, not him. When I put that offering in the offering plate, I'm not helping God. He doesn't need my help. I'm helping me. When I'm showing patience to you, I'm helping me. I'm developing the nature of God. When I'm showing love to someone, it's not I'm tolerating. No, no, no. I don't tolerate. But I'm helping me in the process. You see, I'm here to help me. Don't try to stop me helping me. I told this folks, some, uh, somebody's telling me, Sister Nita, I think, is giving me this speech. She's a spokesperson for the, for the group. <clears throat> and she... She says, we really want to tell you thank you for helping us. And I told her, I said, I'm not helping you. I'm helping you, but I'm not helping you. I'm helping me. Is that right? Is that what I told you? I said, I'm helping me in the process. Because everything I do is designed to make me grow in God. If I can be patient with a young man, it's me that's being affected. If I can't be long-suffering, it's me that's affected. May God help me. You see, we're here to help us. The trial is designed to help you. <clears throat> Amen? And he goes on, he says, so what we do? Verse 19, read it for me, everybody. Go, no, go together. <clears throat> Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. Some, can somebody really get you going? What does it take to make you angry? What does it take? You see, but Wallace, you're sitting there. The devil knows exactly what the button to press to get you going. You're like a robot. We talk about remote control for women. Guess what? The devil got remote control for every one of us. <clears throat> and sometimes he's trying, but that button, I made sure I killed that lust button. So he's trying, it doesn't work. Let me try something, it's gossip. But the Lord helped me there too, so that doesn't work. Ah, I, he got one that works. Because he, whatever you got, human weakness in your life, he will play in that. He will look and see whatever there is available and he'll work in that and some things he gives up on. See, the devil never tempts me to stay home. 
He gave up on that. The devil <coughs> never tempts me to stay home. Does he tempt you? Well, he never, he always gives you a good reason. He never tries that on me. It does not work. He never makes me want to hate somebody for more than five seconds. Doesn't work. Can you tell us what he, what he, what works? <clears throat> well, I can tell you, if you want to know what works, say you got a nose problem and that's what works in you. And so Paul, uh, James went on here, he says, verse 20, for the wrath of God worketh not, uh, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Children of God, we ought to be righteous. And the reason why individuals are given to us that's obnoxious is for us to grow in God. Don't ask God to take it away. Ask God to increase your enemies that you might have some enemies to love. Ask God to increase the negatives in your life so you can have a chance to become an overcomer. Don't hide in the bush. Now face the enemy. Face your fears. Ask God for strength. It's not in human might nor human strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so we move on here. <clears throat> let's, let's, uh, he says, oh, there's so much here. He says, wherefore lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And he goes on. He says, verse 22, be not a, be, a, be doers of the word and not hearers only. See, today's world, we are hearers. This is the age of hearers. And some of us are even dull of hearing. We sit there and says, Amen. And if I stop and say, Amen, for what? Huh? Uh, I don't know. You just said, Amen. Because it sounds like something good, but I can't remember what I said, Amen, for. See, that's the age we're living an age of performers, actors, people that jump in on the bandwagon. Well, everybody else is saying, glory, glory, so I'll do that. See, we need to grow, come off this mold of traditionalism. And start to think, can you think for yourself for a moment? And you're saying, from Vasai, it's wonderful to know you love your pastor. But you got to come to the place of thinking for yourself. If you can think for yourself, you'll never grow. Say, but I have your backside tomorrow, everybody backside behind him, you know. No. You got to be able to serve God for yourself. I tell this church over and over again, if I stop following God, you stop following me. Simple. Put Jesus' priority in your life. Be obedient, yes, but put Jesus as priority. And then he goes on here, he says, For <clears throat> for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his face in the glass. He just forgot what he saw. In service, you enjoy the message, but by the time you reach home, it's gone. Wayside soil. I can't touch everything here, but I can skip over some of these things here and come to chapter 3. He says... Oh, there's so many areas. You need to read the epistle of James. In chapter 3, he says, My brethren, don't try to be a teacher, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. Don't try to be a teacher. Well, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a preacher. You know, if God has not called you to preach, <clears throat> and you get up and promote your own little ideologies, you're damning the people that listen to you. Their blood will God hold at your hand. You know how many people are damned today because the pastor and the preachers 
have missed God? I don't care what you call yourself. We can call ourselves gospel assembly, body of Christ. We can call ourselves whatever. But if God has not called you, what you call yourself is irrelevant. And so we're going on a little further on here. And I want to just move over here because James says, be not many masters. And he tells you, don't be offended. If you don't, don't offend in word, you're a perfect person. That's not easy to happen. Verse 11, that the fountain bring forth uh, from the same place sweet, wa sweet water and bitter. Does a fountain give forth both kinds? If something is dwelling in you that comes up and you got to get angry and you got to speak out against you got a devil in you. It's one thing for him to tempt you. It's another thing to have him in you. All right. We're going to move. I want to come to chapter 3. And right down to the end of that chapter. It says. He says. <clears throat> verse 14. If you have bitter envyings. And strife in your heart. Glory not. Lie not against the truth. How can I lie against the truth? See, the truth here is the reality of who you are. I don't know the truth about Brother Frank. I see him nice, very dedicated man. If I tell him I want something, then he, he's ready to do it. But I don't know the truth about him. Do you know the truth about me, Brother Frank? No, you don't. You see, there's an element that I know about me that nobody else knows. Right. No matter how you poke your nose into my life, Brother Dan, there's some things I keep secret from you that you'd never know. But if I try to pretend to be what I'm not, I'm lying against the reality of who I am. I lie against the truth. Mm -hmm. And that goes a far away. I can say I'm in the body of Christ. And if the Lord does not approve that. I just lied against the reality. Of who I am. Don't lie against the truth. And then he comes on here. And um, he says. Uh, but and what where envying and strife is. Verse 16. There is confusion. And evil work. And every evil work. But the wisdom which is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Let's read that verse 17. Together, go slow. Flash it up. Can you? Are you able? You're not able to? You're not that advanced yet? You can? Let's see your skills. <clears throat> We're clocking down. <laughs> fail. <laughs> you fail. <clears throat> Verse seventeen. Let's go do that together. But the wisdom that is from above. Well, you're wise. You have God working in you. The, the wisdom which is from above is first. It is pure. Everybody say pure. See, I love that word pure. Then it is. Somebody wants to tell you off. What do you do? Somebody revile against you. What do you do? When nobody tells me off and get off, that's because you're full of you. When Jesus was reviled, <coughs> he reviled not again. The spirit of Christ is pure, it's peaceable. And that's my job in this church, is to bring us to the place where we become pure, we become peaceable, we become gentle. We become easy to be entreated. Somebody can help you a long life. And you're not stubborn in your own way. Alright? It says, full of 
not just have a mercy, you're full of mercy. See, if I am a pastor and I can be full of mercy, what kind of pastor I am? I must be full of mercy. You got it up. It says, <clears throat> and good fruits. That's not orange and apples. That's the fruit of the sphere. Added to that, without partiality. <clears throat> I don't have a clique. I'm not have my favorite person. No, without partiality. If God's own son sinned, he would have died. When Israel rebelled, it went into captivity. Doesn't matter who you are. Every transgression, every transgression receive a just recompense of reward. God's not partial. We should not be partial. Without hypocrisy. It says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Of them that make peace. You know, I got so many things to tell you that's much more here. Um, let me just touch this a little bit here and I'm finished. Chapter 4. Paul says, uh, James says, if there come wars and fighting among you, come there not hence of your own lust. We're back to lust and we're back to the what you control, your mouth, your brains, your hands, your heart, your the way you think. He says, come there not of your own lusts. Uh, which war in your members, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You're not pursuing the right course. When you're easily angry, you're easily upset. Can I tell you my diagnosis? Can I tell you why? When you're short-tempered, you're easily upset. You have no mercy. No patience. Can I tell you my diagnosis? You don't pray. I'm not talking thank give God thanks for the food. I'm talking you don't pray. When you learn to pray and wait on God, your spirit gets softened. Brother Dan, there's no way I can rebuke you. I can treat you bad when I'm praying for you. If I get down and I pray, you say you're very impatient and you told me off something and I go down and I said, God, you know, he's just a human. Just like every one of us. I remember, Lord, when I was impatient. But Lord, help Brother Dan. Okay? Help him to be patient. And as soon as I'm finished pay, praying, I get up and I walk out and there you're coming in. My child... I just prayed for him. He lost his temper again. So I get back angry? No. If I prayed for you long enough, I would change my attitude. And the reason why we have attitudes to people, you have enemies. You have enemies. You don't have peace of mind. You have enemies. You can't pray for them. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. You don't need to go out in the world. Find the church. Who are your enemies in the church? And pray for their blessing and prosperity. Amen. You do that? How long we said, Brother Ed? One month. You do that for one month and your attitude will change towards that person. But it's not the person on trial. It's you on trial. Always remember, it's you on trial, not the person. The enemies, the wars, the battles around you are given to you for your development. Amen? Amen. And James went on. <clears throat> he says, um, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 4, he says, you adulterers and adulteresses. This is not physical adultery. That's bad. This is spiritual adultery. James is talking about friendship with the world. So I belong to Jesus. And if I belong to Jesus, why am I hobnobbing with some other woman out there, spiritually speaking? Why am I drinking of the fashion? Why am I drinking of the sports? Why am I drinking of false religion? 
stir the wine of our fornication is widespread. You belong to Jesus, you feel uncomfortable drinking of the wine of our fornication because you belong to Jesus. <clears throat> when you turn the television on and you're watching radio television preachers, you're a fornicator. You got it? Am I right or wrong here? Come on. You're a fornicator. Because you don't know if you belong to the body of Christ or do you want. Oh, but I just want to see. See what? There'll come a time, Brother John, when nobody will call you. They don't call me. There'll come a time when they won't call you no more. They'll take your number off their list. You see, they took mine off. When they backslide from this church, they don't call me. They backslide for real. When they call you, they feel they got a shot at you. And when they backslide from this church, I don't call them either. I call them one time, two times, that's it. You turn against the work of God, you turn against me. See, I got some principles I live with. I'm not imprisoned by principles, but I got principles that I think Jesus would have. When, the, when Jesus tell them, eat my flesh, drink my blood, they all left. He told Peter and James and John, he says, run, go get them back. Take their phone number, give them a call every so often. Listen, you leave the church, you abandon God, I abandon you. You got that? So when you backslide sitting here, don't call me. Well, I must leave the 99 and go after the one you think you're Jesus. He does that. He does that. The good shepherd does that, not me. My job is to preach the word of God. And a man that's a heretic after the first and second admonition, I reject. That's my job. That's the commandment of God for me. See why I don't have a lot of evil? Because the word I preach is less than the one Jesus preached. It's less than the one Paul preached. I still compromise a little bit. But there's coming a time when I stop compromising, whether it's family or friends. Because, see, the new year is going to come around and, and the new year... We have some nephews, some family, some cousins, and all of these that are not in church. Right. And Good Friday is a day to invite us to go spend some time with them. You know what it's on? Good Friday. Good Friday is my day. <coughs> you want me to spend some time with you? Come to church. Spend some time with me first, <laughs> and then I come spend some time with you. Not putting myself into in, in, under pressure here now. <clears throat> but I can't come to church. Well, guess what, my friend? You take the food and eat it yourself. I can't come to your occasion. See, that's me. That's me. You don't have to follow me. Follow me as I follow Jesus. He would do the same. Sorry I took half an hour extra of your time. But James went on, he says, <clears throat> Oh, let me finish up here. Verse 7, 8, and <clears throat> let's go. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. <clears throat> if there is no devil, I don't have any. No, no, no. He's always going to be there until you're dead. He's going to try right to your dying bed to see if you can curse God. Resist him. But I want to cuss. Resist him. I want to scream. Resist him. I want to gossip. Resist him. 
so much flesh. Resist the devil, and he's not going to stick around. He'll flee. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. But James, you're writing to church people here. Oh, yeah. Amen. Read it out. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. I don't like James. Well, I love the man. <laughs> I love the man. You don't like him? I love him. He's calling them children of God sinners. He says, cleanse your hand, you sinners. Purify your soul, your heart, your double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Stop happy, happy, happy every day of your life. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Because it will help you to develop your spiritual life. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humility and poverty is two different things. See, David said, I'm a worm and no man. When you look on the ground, not everything that crawls on the ground is a worm. Not everything that crawls on the ground, oh, humble, humble, that humble rattlesnake. Huh? Step on him. You'll find out he's not a worm. He's a rattlesnake. Not because something look humble, is it humble? Humility is a gift from God. It's a part of the workings of the Holy Ghost in your life. And it goes on here. He says, um, <clears throat> where am I? I lost my scripture. He says, humble yourself. Purify your hearts, you double-minded man. Be afflicted and mourn, weep. Humble yourself, verse 10. Before the Lord, speak. Everybody, verse 11. Speak not evil. One of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, judgeth his brother. Speaketh evil of the law, judgeth the law. And if you judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And he goes on and condemns that. This is a beautiful epistle. You should read this when you go home. Last two verses were 16 and 17. But now you rejoiced in your boastings. Uh, does it sound like some people I know? Well, praise the Lord, we are the body of Christ. You leave all those people out there in Babylon. No, no, no. The stronger we become members of the body of Christ, is the more humble we'll become. And we'll not be boasting that, you know, we are it. No. Don't boast, God. Jesus, Paul told us the, 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 the Romans, he says, that he cut off the, the Jews. No, don't boast. For if he grafted you, he cut off the true olive branch. And he grafted you, he cut them off because of their unbelief, and you're grafted in because of the grace of God. Don't take that grace for granted. Because as fast as he cut off the Jews, he'll cut us off too. And the problem is, it is sad that many of us are cut off and we don't even know. I think we got God. You know, I talked about Richard, I'm finished. I'm finished, I promise you I'm going to finish. But I talked about Richard today. And I, I said, <clears throat> I'm on the ladder, of course. I'm on the ladder, of course. Phone rings. Always oh, happen, Brother Dan. I don't know when your phone rings. I'm on the ladder, phone rings. Come now, I said, Brother Richard, <clears throat> I'm on the ladder. He says, you're on the ladder doing what? So I told him, I said, the more I pray for the healing of God, the less I see it happen. So I'm making an extra shelf in my medicine cabinet. Because the drugs increase and the healing doesn't. I didn't lie against the truth. That was the truth. The pills, the vitamins need more shelf. <laughs> so I start making another shelf on top there. Before you know it, another one is coming in. God help us. We need the power of God in our midst. But until we come up to the place of being honest with ourselves and seek after God desperately, we're not going to get it. You won't get it because we talk about it. You'll get it if my people 
which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God said he'll hear and answer. So is there a reason why God is not answering? Well, you and I can figure it out, but may God help us. Can we pray? Father, tonight we thank you for another night in your house. Thank you for this time we spend together, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for men like James and Peter and, and Paul and these examples of scripture, Father. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the written word, O oh, Father, that we can read and be nurtured. But, O oh, Father, help us not to be hearers of the word only, but to implement and incorporate your word in our lives, that we become doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us, we pray, Father, in this assembly and anywhere your people are gathered around the world in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are certainly glad to be in church tonight. And beautiful exhortation from Brother John. Um, the enthusiasm he developed at the end was a result of his faith and confidence in, the, in this church and the message he believes in. I know we are... 7.30, and normally on a Saturday night, I'd like to send you home early, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit here before we go home, <clears throat> and um, I thought we had a great service on Wednesday night. Uh, over tonight, I'd like to not just beat around too much, but to get to the point, I'm looking at the Epistle of James. And uh, this beautiful song, Chosen in God for Redemption's Plan. And you think about each one of us here tonight. There's a process that God must take us through. And uh, the process that God is taking us through would either prepare us for the first resurrection that comes in two phases, first and second phase, or it will prepare us for the final resurrection, which over the years has been really seen as a bad resurrection. But it's not really that bad. The final resurrection is a resurrection where the general harvest would be reaped. Uh, there are people that will come up and will die again under the judgment of God, but the masses will come up in the final resurrection and be saved. The first resurrection is not an easy resurrection to be a part of. Uh, we like to sing that song, oh, I want to be in the first, uh, that's a good desire. But the first phase of the first resurrection uh, resurrects individuals that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's not easy to do. Uh, the second phase are they that stand without fault before the throne of God. That's not easy to accomplish either. Uh, but if we fail to make it in the first or second phase of the first resurrection, then the final resurrection will have that element that will rise up and be saved. Uh, Jesus told the Pharisees uh, in, his, um, in his address, I think it was in Matthew, the 12th chapter, he says, the Queen of the South shall rise with this generation and condemn it. For she repented, uh, she, uh, what did it say? Let me get that scripture. It's, um, I'm back in James here, but I just want to back up here into Matthew, the 12th or 13th chapter, 12th chapter of Matthew. And Jesus, the, the people here wanted to see a sign. And uh, they asked and said, we want to see a sign. And uh, Jesus um, told them, uh, here in verse 38, um, there, there are so many beautiful things in this chapter 12 of Matthew. He talks about demon possession and casting out. Do you know, here in Matthew chapter 12, and when the Pharisees, they heard 
that Jesus, they heard uh, Jesus cast out demons, right? It was in that verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. See, sometimes blindness and dumbness is demonically inspired. And this boy, apparently the child or whoever it was, was born blind and dumb. And you cast the demon out and that person could be free. I'm not talking about old age catching up on you, where the body is worn out. I'm talking about a young man born dumb and deaf, uh, a mute, uh, they would call him in today's society. And Jesus, they brought this young man, dumb and blind and dumb. Um, and um, where is it? And he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Uh, people are always astonished. You remember that statement I made? The greatest enemies uh, to mission are prejudice and indifference with ignorance being the mother of both and uh, you'll be surprised to know how many people would not accept what you say because they become familiar with you uh, you can be a child of God sent from God but if the people know you uh, they will become familiar with you and not receive your word as the word of God and this was commendable uh, with some of the churches that Paul preached. Paul says, you receive not our word. Uh, the Thessalon Thessalonians, right? Thess Thessalonica, he, uh, Thessalonians he spoke to. And he made that statement. I got your finger in James and I've got your hand in Matthew. And here I am running to Thessalonians right now. I think it's the uh, first Thessalonians. Uh, might want here, First Thessalonians, uh, Paul says, he says, uh, <clears throat> for this cause we thank God, chapter 2, and verse, um, as a matter of fact, chapter 1 and verse 6 says, and you became, he told the people at the saints at Thessalonica, he said, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. See, when God raises up a ministry, people are to follow the ministry and the Lord. See, the Lord is not here literally, but he's got uh, sometimes an appointed ministry uh, that people need to follow. And uh, Paul said here to the Thessalonians, he says, verse uh, 6 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction. It was not a church with a lot of joy, joy, joy. Uh, but they received the word in much affliction with joy. Isn't that what it says? With joy of the Holy Ghost. See, the, the joy of God doesn't come uh, when you receive a check in the mail. Uh, the word of God, the, the joy that the Holy Ghost gives doesn't come because everybody's treating you nice. The joy of the Holy Ghost might come when you're afflicted and you're persecuted. You, there's a joy that comes up. I'm pleased to suffer with him. And this is something uh, we need to talk about maybe later uh, tonight. I'm not sure. But Paul goes on here in chapter 2 and um, uh, he says here, uh, in verse, uh, just to make it short, he says, he tells the saints that they walk worthily. He says, you witness, verse 10, second chapter, verse 10, you witness that God also, uh, and God also is a witness, he says, how holily and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. Uh, it's important that ministers conduct themselves as ministers. It is important that every one of us that are part of the ministry, we carry ourselves with dignity and with a certain, uh, certain respect for the ministry and the office that we hold. Uh, we can't just run loose, put loose and fancy free and hope to represent God. But Paul says... He says, when we were there, and uh, it might have been Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, 
the company Paul, he is writing uh, here to this church. He said, how, how, how holily, uh, I like that. He says, you witness, and God also is witness, how holily, how we behaved ourselves holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and commanded and charged every one of you as a father that his children. That's what a pastor does. He gets up there and uh, hopes that the word of God that he promotes would reach on in and penetrate the hearts of the children of God in that assembly and change them, uh, exhort them. And he goes on further on, uh, verse 13. He says, um, oh, verse, verse 12, he says that you walk worthy of God. Everybody say, worthy of God. Worthy. See, I'm here preaching to you and talking to you tonight. And my desire is that you...